We're blessed to have such great man of God as we do, Brother Huntley. Would you welcome him? God bless him. And everybody said, praise the Lord. It is an overwhelming privilege to stand at such a, a moment of significance in the kingdom of God. Because what happens at because of the time sends a rippling wave of effect, not just across North America, but around the world. And all of you have been here at a time, the word has been oft stated and repeated, and yet it is so very true that the atmosphere is latent with a spirit of destiny. That God is doing things here that we will refer to, that will turn the corner, that will make a difference, that will be forever remembered in the hearts and lives of all of those that are gathered in this place. And I thank you very much for the honor of invitation of standing at such a tremendous moment and sharing the ministry with those who have preceded me. What magnificent preaching of the word of the Lord. I say it every year. I don't know that I've ever heard it more directed of the Holy Ghost. There's been an awesome flow of direction of the Spirit that is fearful in what God is doing at this very moment. I want to extend a challenge through the Scriptures again this year to our young ministers in particular that are in this room. What an opportunity to be a young minister in the apostolic movement. And you need to maximize your potential for God to the very nth degree of its possibility. I give honor to all the ministers who preceded me. I give honor to our elected officials and the district superintendent and all that are on this platform this afternoon. And I hasten to take you to the word of the Lord for the burden that I feel upon my soul. Give honor to Brother Rex Johnson who preceded me. What a wonderful man of God and a great Christian he is. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And we will read one verse of Scripture. I appreciate the friendship that I have in the United Pentecostal Church and even outside the United Pentecostal Church. It's a wonderful camaraderie and fellowship, and I give thanks for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. The temptation is common to man. I want to preach to you this afternoon for a few minutes on this subject. The temptation of this time. Can we be challenged one more time? Can we arise to a challenge one more time? My motive and ambition and burden today is to challenge the young ministry that are in this room. What I'd like for you to do is kind of push on your neighbor a little bit and say, It's all right, it's all right. To, be different. to be different. It's all right, it's all right. to be different. Put your Bible down and give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise right now. Thanksgiving unto God for His power and His presence. Jesus, I believe you now, Lord. And I'll ask you to help me preach just a few minutes, and I'll preach fast. God bless you. You may be seated. The temptation of this time. Every era, every age has had its peculiar 
temptation. And I would like to express to you what I feel the Spirit has pinpointed to be the temptation of this time in the apostolic era. The Lord's Prayer is a reference to temptation. For in Matthew 6 and 13, the Bible said, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The evil is the result and the ramification of yielding to temptation. Temptation in itself is not evil, but the yielding to it is what renders the evil. In Matthew 26 and 41, the Bible said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but it's the flesh that is weak. So I will be preaching for the next little while on the subject, the temptation of this time. It is not the sinister sins of a sick society. It is the pressure and the pull upon the people of the pew and the spectators underneath the steeple. It is the pressure of the apostolic movement at this moment. What is that particular temptation? It is simply this. It is to personally compromise and be content with common Pentecostal Christianity. The temptation of our flesh at this time is to sell out the excellence that's in us and the energy that's in us and the dream that's in us for something relative to just common Pentecostal Christianity. It is characterized by minimal commitment, small vision, low desire, and little faith. It is to be reduced to the lowest level of acceptance rather than to rise to the highest levels of challenge. I'm preaching about spiritual erosion and a spirit that says you got to go along so you can get along. It's to become so you can please some. It's to be normal, average, common, similar, or the same. But I want to tell you that God has always, young man, sought for, solicited, and selected that which is uncommon. No one should leave this place without feeling the hour has come to rise out of commonness into something exceptional for God. I don't want to be a common preacher. I don't want to be a common pastor. I don't want to be a common Pentecostal. I don't want to pastor a common church. I don't want to have common church. The temptation of this time is to become common. Push your brother and say, it's all right to be different. I'm telling you, God is looking for young men that are uncommon in consecration. They are uncommon in dedication. They are uncommon in commitment. They are uncommon in personal prayer. They are uncommon in their worship and in their praise and in their soul winning and in their witnessing. It's time to come out of the crowd and become uncommon for God. God has always sought after, selected, That which was uncommon. The prophet asked for water in the time of a drought. He asked for food in the time of a famine. Commonness has never arrested God's attention. God's always looked for that which in its community was uncommon. 
uncommon. There's a reason that Job could withstand the devil's greatest assault. And the way I read it in Scripture, he did it without God's help. Because Job said, I looked on the left, and he wasn't there. I looked on the right, and he wasn't there. Do you know Job withstood the devil's greatest assault without God's help? Even his wife said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? Sometimes our greatest revelations come from the most likely source. She said, curse God and die. Job had a light to go on in his head, and a thought ran through his mind. Is that a possibility? That all you got to do is curse God, and you can die? Well, if you can curse God and die, then it must be true that you can bless God and live. I want to tell you, you got a choice here today. It's curse God and die or bless God and live. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. There's a reason Job ended up with twice what he started with. I don't think this thing should fizzle out. I don't think we should become less. I think the church is destined to go from glory to glory and from victory to victory. And that each of us should end up with twice what we started with. There's a reason all of that could happen in Job's life. Because when Job got ready to be blessed by God, and God wanted to give him a nice introduction, and God wanted to give him an accolade, God could not find one that had ever been used in reference to a man. So God borrowed one of his own. And God said, Job, I want you to know there's not another in the earth like him. God challenged the devil with that phrase that Job, there was no one else like him in the earth. And that's why God could bless him. Because God blesses the uncommon. We've got to rise out of mediocrity. We've got to rise out of commonplace. We've got to rise out of the familiar and become something uncommon for God. Now I want you to notice the word of the Lord and here's where I really want to bring some attention. The Spirit has been visiting this conference. The call of God in a very exceptional way has been dealing with us. We rejoice and should rejoice. Can you remember your deliverance from sin? Do you remember the call of God when you were a sinner? Do you remember how God disrupted the normality of your life to bring you out of sin into salvation? What a miracle it is here today that our fingers are not nicotine stained. That our lungs are not stained. That our breath is pure and clean. Because God brought us out of a world of sin. Clap your hands and thank God for your salvation right now. Thank God for your deliverance right now. I'm so glad I don't want a cigarette today. I'm so glad I don't want a beer today. I'm so glad I don't want an illicit drug today. But I want you to understand that's your first deliverance. And what the Spirit is trying to do right now is bring about... A second deliverance. And here's what the word of the Lord says in 2 Timothy 2 and 20. But in a great house, in a great house, there are not only 
vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. I want you to shout right now, a great house. Every once in a while, I think every pastor assumes the role that I assume. I become the defender of the church. I am set for the defense of the church. If you're going to come to me with an accusation about the pastor, I, the people I pastor, you better have your proverbial ducks in a row because I'm going to defend them. But every once in a while, someone will come to me and they'll say, Pastor, did you know what she did? Or do you know what he did? Or, or have you heard about what took place? And then they'll say, What kind of a church is this? And I quickly tell them, It's a great church. Because in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold. There's not only vessels of silver. But in a great house, there's wood, there's earth. There's some to honor and there's some to dishonor in a great church. Don't ever think you're going to get every hypocrite out. Don't ever think you're going to get every person that's not what they should be out. And don't ever look bad at your church. It's still a great church. But verse 21 says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What we have not understood is that not only must we be delivered from the world, There is a second dimension of deliverance. Because the Bible said it's a great house. But in that great house, there is still in the congregation a great contradiction. And if you're going to be a vessel of honor, and you're going to be sanctified for the Master's use, you're going to have to be delivered from the church. Don't stop the tape yet. I said there's another deliverance that's got to come. Not only deliverance from the world, but a deliverance from the church. Because in the church there's gold, there's silver. There's wood, there's earth. There's honor, there's dishonor. There's spiritual, there's carnal. There's faith, there's unbelief. There's Philadelphia, there's Laodicea. There's saints, there's ain'ts. There's powerful, there's prayerless. Those that praise God and those that are pleased to let the others praise God. And if you're going to have revival and be used of God, you're going to have to be delivered from modern day professional Pentecostalism. The second deliverance is being delivered from mediocre, mundane, business as usual, formalistic, ritualistic, get in, get it done, and get it over Pentecostalism. I want to preach to you young preachers right now. If God's going to use you, you're going to have to be separated from the church. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. And in your attitude, you can't be a bitch warmer and be used by God. Your call to God is no excuse to skip prayer meeting. A call of God is no excuse not to back your pastor. That spirit is in the church, but you got to be delivered from it. Stand up and clap your hands right now. He 
He said you're going to have to purge yourself. You're going to have to purge yourself. The pressure and the temptation of this time is to be similar and to strive just to survive and to be known as one of them when our real challenge is not to blend in but to be uncommon with God. It's to be uncommon with God. You can't run with the playboys and be God's man. You can't sit with the carnals and be used of God. Something's got to rise in you that'll make you become uncommon in a common community. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Turn around to somebody and say it's time to be uncommon. It's time to be uncommon. We need deliverance from Pentecostalism. That is inherited religion. And it's just common Christianity. Just ritualism. Combing your hair like everybody. Buying the clothes everybody's buying. Walking like everybody's walking. Getting the gesture somebody's got. You're going to have to come out of that and let God make you what He wants you to be. He's always used that which is uncommon. Push your neighbor and say, it's all right to be different. It's all right to be different. I feel the pressure that wants to settle us down. I feel the pressure that wants us all to become alike. That's what I like about because of the times. Contrary to what somebody might think, nobody writes my messages. And nobody previews my sermons. This pulpit's unfettered. It's time to come out of the ranks of normality and commonness because God only uses the uncommon. I don't know how it happens. I don't know how it gets there. But in every church and in every youth group, there is a certain sect that kind of wants to become the mafia of the group. And about the time somebody stands up to do something they don't like, they jerk their coattail to pull them back. You got two or three teenagers in the youth group and they scare the daylights out of the rest of the young people. You got two or three reprobates in the congregation and they kill the rest of the church. I say it's time to stand up for God and come out of that commonness. Don't let them ruin you and run you. As far as anybody's concerned, you don't have to have their stamp of approval. You don't have to have their stamp of approval. You just be what God wants you to be. Somebody said we were all born originals, but a whole lot of us die copies. Whatever God's given to you, you be that. And don't be common. And don't let anybody pressure you into a situation where you won't be accepted. You won't be in the clique. You won't be in the group. If that's the way it's got to be, get out of it. And let God do in your life what He wants to do.
The problem as I see it today is the same as a, a gentleman had that I was told about. Called his buddy, he said, there's a pond in my backyard. It's close to the house. He said, we can't sleep at night. There must be a hundred frogs in that pond. They keep us awake all night. He said, would you come over and see if you can get those frogs out? The old frog gigger came over. The next morning, to the surprise of his invited host, the host said, well, how many did you get? You must have got a hundred. He took his fingers and held up two frogs. He said, that's all that was in there. Two frogs that sounded like an army. The terrorism in the church today is the problem that we have with a vocal minority and a silent majority. It's just a couple old frogs. And somebody needs to rise up and say it's all right to be different. If nobody prays in your church but you, pray! If nobody shouts in your church but you, shout! If nobody believes in revival, believe in revival! Don't be contained. Don't be imprisoned by the church. If you don't believe what I'm saying is true, tell me what happens to new converts. They come in wild. They come in jumping. They come in fired up. But after a little while, they become like the community. They will come down to where that church is unless there's a church that's really on fire for God. Young preacher, you need to break out of the church. When I was a student at Texas Bible College, a long time ago, Noah started it when he came out of the ark. It was during the era of the Vietnam War. Brother Rex Johnson was there. Brother Mark Foster was there. A lot of guys were in Bible college that time. And Brother Pugh was there. As an instructor. <laughs> there never has been a freshman class as large as... The Vietnam days of Texas Bible College. We may see a great increase in our Bible colleges here shortly. But on Friday nights, I went to Bible College to preach. On Friday nights, I would come out of the dorm to go preach at some little bitty church somewhere that to me was because of the times. And I had two suits. So I put on one of my suits and I had my guitar case in one hand. I'll explain that maybe momentarily. And my Bible under my arm. And I had to go through the, the volleyball arena. And the hamburger cooking. And the dating. And I come through there with...
with my Bible, my guitar, and my suit and tie. And the cool dudes would holler, Where you going, Rev? Burn them up, Rev! Let them have it, preach! And I just walk right through them because I wanted to have revival. What I'm saying is not everybody that sits here is in tune with what God wants to do and you've got to ignore them. I don't care where you are and I don't care who your pastor is. You can have revival. I'd come out of there and you know I thought they'd be encouraging me. I thought they'd be excited for me. I mean they ridiculed me. A Bible school. Come walking out of there with my, 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 my Bible and my little guitar. Now notice, I mentioned that guitar. The reason I had a guitar is because I couldn't play a guitar. I never learned to play a guitar. <laughs> But I wanted to. <laughs> because if your wife didn't play an accordion and you couldn't play a guitar, you couldn't get a revival. <laughs> and I faked everybody because I never could play a guitar, Brother Johnson. But Patsy would play her accordion and we'd get up and start singing. And I'd beat the daylights out of that thing. In a little while, I just start hopping around. And most of the times, I never did get to preach. People start running to the altar. People start getting the Holy Ghost. It wasn't what I was doing. It's where it's coming from. A burning desire to be uncommon for God. You may be saying, if you don't preach like Brother Tenney, don't quit preaching. If you can't preach like Rex Johnson, don't quit preaching. If you can't preach like Mike Williams, don't quit preaching. If you can't sing like Brother Merle, you don't quit singing. Just do what you can with all you've got. God ain't going to determine what kind of revival you have by how many buttons you got on your coat. Or how many snaps you got on your shoes. Or whether you got concrete hair or no hair. There is a pressure in this apostolic movement to try to make us all be the same. Look alike. Walk alike. Talk alike. Settle you down. Tune you in. Synchronize you. Settle you into what everybody else is. But what God's looking for is somebody that will rise out of the community of common and be something uncommon for God. Come on up here, Brother Maddox. I want to use you just a minute. I want to introduce you to somebody. If you don't know him, you need to know him. Brother Arnold gave him a tremendous reference. Come on up here. This guy right here is one of the greatest soul winners, greatest preachers that you'll ever meet in Pentecost. We recently had him in our church, and he was like a, a breath of fresh air and a cup of cold water. You know why? 
when he preaches. He is shaking from head to toe under the anointing of God. He does cartwheels, rolls in the floor. He don't care what anybody. Pentecost, we must never lose that fire and that radical zeal and that joy of the Lord. Stand up with me just a minute. Don't get your hopes up. I'm not through. I wonder what you would do for God. I wonder what you would be for God if you weren't bound by somebody in this room. Understanding. I got a message for you today, and I don't mean to sound whatever, but if I can't be accepted as I am, I'm at the wrong place. Don't try to calm me down. Don't try to get my shout out of me. Don't try to settle me. When the wind blew at Pentecost, it was not a soft, a gentle breeze. I said it wasn't a soft, gentle breeze. But a Russian mighty wind. And when a wind comes, it messes stuff up. It rearranges everything. You're going to go back to where you ain't worried about your shirt tail being in anymore. And you're not worried about your curls anymore. And you're not worried about how you look on the film anymore. And you're not worried about what somebody thinks about you or says about you. I wonder what God would do right now if you could just get free from the person beside you. looking for the uncommon he's looking for the uncommon push your neighbor say let me go say let me go let me go the Bible said you're going to have to purge yourself from that which is in the church that is not of God that that's not pleasing to God that's not what God wants even in the church you're going to have to have a deliverance I was telling you about carrying that guitar. Never did learn to play it. Fooled a lot of people. I broke more guitar strings than you could ever count. Boy, they started shouting when I'd pop those strings. I don't know where those Bible school boys are today. But by God's grace and His mercy, I'm at because of the time. Go ahead and be like them if you want to, but there's probably not much in your future. Don't let them rob you of your dynamic future in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead, shout. Go ahead, talk in tongues. 
Go ahead and get high in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Don't let somebody bind you. I was preaching a revival, one of my very first revivals, for the legendary, powerful, camp meeting preacher who is now deceased, Brother R. E. Johnson. Brother Johnson liked to drink a cup of coffee when you came in and a cup when you go out. So one day he said, Brother Huntley, you want a cup of coffee? I said, no, sir. I, uh, I don't drink coffee. You don't drink coffee! His words. My Lord, brother, we can't have revival if you don't drink coffee. I said, pour me a cup. <laughs> if it takes a guitar to have revival, I'll beat on one. If it takes drinking coffee to have revival, pour me a cup. I'm just going to do whatever it takes to get the blessing of God. No matter what anybody else is doing. While you're still standing just a moment, everybody stand. If your wife is with you today, I want you to place your hand on her shoulder. And I want you to say, in the name of Jesus, I loose my wife to be in the Holy Ghost, whatever God wants her to be. There are too many women in our church that are bound by their husbands. You need to let them go in the Holy Ghost and let God use them. If they want to shout, get out of their way. If they want to prophesy, get out of their way. If they want to intercede, get out of their way. My wife never looks more beautiful than when her hair is shouted down and her cheeks are red and she's been worshiping God. We need to set each other free. Now, remain standing. Lady, it may be your husband's not nearly what he could be or what you want him to be. But he might be a lot better off if you'd get off his back. And quit chewing on him. And wishing he was like somebody else. Yeah. Go ahead. And he comes to church afraid to raise his hands. Because you got him under a guilt complex. your husband and say in the name of Jesus I release you in the Holy Ghost I'm not going to laugh at you if you shout I'm not going to make fun of you if you prophesy I'm not going to condemn you if the Holy Ghost uses you I'm going to turn you loose You need victory over the church. Don't let the deadhead stop you. Don't let carnality rule you. Don't let the backsliders dominate you. Get on fire and do what God wants you to do in the Holy Ghost.
you do if you didn't care what somebody would say? I said, what would you do? God, deliver us from the opinions of others. Deliver us from the fear of the common. Loose us. when I leave the cause of the times they're not going to squeeze me back into their mold when I leave the cause of the times they're not going to pull me down to where they are when I leave the cause of the times I'm not going to go down to where they are loose us deliver us set us free I saved a lot of my introductory remarks for this moment. Let me tell you why because of the times is what it is. And why the Pentecostals of Alexandria are what they are. It's because this man is very uncommon. If most of us would have taken this church from the Mangans, we'd have bought our planes and booked our cruises and built our mansions and flew all over the world and lived off the reputation of what they had built. That is common. is a blue blood he can't help it it's a blessing from God he's a bureaucrat he's raised in the spiritual palace but he's refused to be Michael and look out the window and make fun of the pasture manor boys David came out of the pasture. His wife came out of the palace. And that's why he wasn't ashamed to dance before God. Because his praise was uncommon. There's a lot more I want to preach and a lot to say, but I just want to go in the Holy Ghost here, all right? Ten! It's the uncommon! It's the uncommon! That's going to break this church loose in revival! We must not yield to the temptation to be common. We've got to stay unique and set apart and free. If he can do that, you can do that. If he can do that, you can do that. Turn around to 
or three people to say, let me go. Let me go. Maybe I've never done it before, but it's time to do it. Maybe I've never been this way before, but it's time to be it. Let me go. Yeah, 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 yeah